And so I'm going to go into the word for this morning, and uh, the title of the message this morning just simply means, says, in all things. In how many things? In how many things? In how many things? In how many things? In all things. The Bible says, what should we do? We give thanks. We give thanks in all things, but the Bible also enjoins us to do certain things in all things. It is not only the giving of thanks. Giving of thanks is good because it is good to have a grateful heart. The giving of thanks is good because even the world now, they talk about practicing gratitude. And so everybody understands. It's the same principle. It's the principle of God that says in all things, give thanks. And that principle can be applied in many ways. And so somebody says, I don't want it to look as if it's scripture, so I'm going to say, I am going to have an attitude of gratitude. Either you have an attitude of gratitude or you give thanks in all things, it is the same. And basically what he says is that wherever you find yourself, always recognize that it could be worse. That is the first reason why you should give thanks. Always recognize that it could be worse. Most of you don't like the snow. But I can tell you that some 17 years ago, this was nothing. So it could be what? It could be worse. I remember a particular year that everybody had to hire people to go on their roof so that your roof will not collapse. Because the weight of the snow was so much that people were sleeping in their houses and suddenly they would hear a loud bang only to find out that the roof has caved in. I don't think any of you have shoveled your, your roof yet. Have you? Have you? Aha. So it could be what? Worse. And so every time you want to complain, because that's a gift a lot of us have, Every time you want to complain, what's the first thing you remember? It could be worse. I will get there now. Let me read. The Bible says in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul had been talking in chapter 4 about what to expect. He starts chapter 5 by talking about it. He goes on to talk about the things that we shouldn't do and the kind of people that we shouldn't associate with. And then he gets to verse 16, and then he says, rejoice always. That's verse 16. Then he goes ahead in verse 17, and he says, never stop praying. The ones that you guys say, pray without ceasing. And then he goes on and says, whatever happens, keep thanking God. Brethren, there are three things there that he summarizes for us to do. And those three things, I will talk about them briefly this morning, and then I will continue the second service, because we have been talking about attitude, and the attitude that we have towards certain things determines how we react in those situations. I've told you before, whenever people come to me and they complain about snow, I always tell them that I thank God because spring is coming. And either you like it or not, we are nearer to spring than we are to winter. Every time I set my time at home, I have a timer for some lights, and so every 21st of the month, I go to that timer and I change the timer because I am expecting spring. I am expecting that in another briefly four weeks, we will change our time. And when we change our time, then there will be more daylight. And when there is more daylight, there is more life. I have often wondered for the longest time, why is it that God did it in such a way that the so-called prosperous countries have cold? But the so-called poor countries have sunshine. And so the people that have the code and the money will spend their money to come to where the sunshine is. Is that not what we all do? You go to Cancun and all these places. 
What are we doing? We are spreading the wealth that God has given us so that we can tap on what they have that we don't have. I have never seen anybody say, oh, I just wish I wanted to see what the snow looks like. Let me pay and go to Canada in January. <laughs> so in all things, you give thanks. But I, I'll go through a few things here. Because when we were talking about attitude, we started by talking about asking yourself. You remember we talked about where you start and where you end. Where you end is supposed to be according to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It says we all with unveiled faces that we are transformed in the same image from glory to glory. Right? Remember that. Now, it means that, and then when you go to James, James says it's like a man that looks at himself in the mirror and he goes away. When you look at yourself in the mirror, then you see what you are now as compared to what you want to be. What you want to be is the perfection of God. And so you ask yourself, number one, what is my character like? You know, one of the greatest things anybody can do is to personally judge their character by themselves. Don't wait for anybody to judge your character for you. Judge it by yourself. What is your attitude, for example, towards discouragement? I learned long ago, long ago, and this is just me now talking now. I learned long ago that if you want to marry, don't just go to McDonald's. Don't just go to the amusement park. Go to the mechanic workshop. Let me see your attitude when my car breaks down. Even if the car doesn't break down, pretend that the car broke down. Let me see your attitude towards disappointment. Then I will know that, ah, <laughs> flesh and blood has not revealed this one unto me. Because there are some things you don't need to wait for God to speak. Circumstance will tell you. Oh, brethren, everybody is nice when things are going well. Everybody is a Christian when things are going well. Let me tell you the truth. I remember somebody told me once, a Christian. In, the, in my language, Jesus is spelled J-E-S-U without the last S. Right? But then there's also another name in that name, if you remove the first J. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so, a Christian got offended. And he said, today, I remove the J. And I will act according to the remaining part of the name. <laughs> what is the kind of attitude that person has when there is adversity? Are we together? <laughs> So, what is your attitude towards correction? You know, we've talked about that. What is your attitude towards failure? How many people have failed before? Uh, people, they won't raise their hand now. <laughs> You'll be telling your child that you used to confess in your class all the time. <laughs> Brethren, oh, I have failed before. I know what it is like. When you fail, you learn some things. If you have never failed, you will never have the opportunity to learn those things. And so your attitude towards failure has to be, as the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, rejoice always. I know that might be difficult. You go to your father. And say, Father, you know, I, I, you know what I failed, but the Bible says I should, I should rejoice. So I'm going, to the, I'm going to the movies with my friends. At that point in time, pray that your father is not like me. But are we, not, are we together? The Bible says rejoice. When you rejoice, it means that you are believing God that this too will not last. You are believing God that this too will change. All throughout COVID, it's been quite challenging for a lot of people. But then you always draw strength in the fact that 
even a journey of 40 years for the Israelites, they completed it. Nobody knows how long COVID will last. When you start being depressed from year two, <laughs> what if you last for seven years? Brother, tear up and do what? Rejoice. And for always, always, you know, there are some things I'm not gifted in. I've always loved people that can go to parties. They go to work. All they are thinking about is on Saturday, I will rejoice. <laughs> and the same reason why I love Christians that I look forward earnestly to Sunday service. That on Sunday, it doesn't matter. You can abuse me on Monday. I'm looking forward to Sunday. You can abuse me on Tuesday. I'm looking forward to what? Sunday. You can abuse me on Wednesday. I'm looking forward to what? Sunday. So when people are saying, thank God it's Friday, he's saying, thank God Sunday is near. So that's why when you see some people dancing in church, you don't know what they've seen. No, <laughs> no that's the truth. In those days, we used to say, dance away your sorrow. Brethren, I have realized in life, you go to a graduation. Normally, it's the mothers that will dance and you find out that the fathers are trained to just look somber and serious, that kind of thing, right? When you see a mother dancing and rolling and what? She's thanking God for the sacrifices she went through. Are we together? So thank God for failure. So why do you rejoice? Let me give you some specific reasons why daily you need to rejoice. And those three things, you can never separate them. Rejoicing, praying, and thanking God, you can never separate them. And I'm going to be talking about them together. You rejoice, number one, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. You rejoice because your present may not be palatable, but your future is secured. That's the first reason everybody should rejoice every day. When you wake up, you may not feel like going to work. Right? And if you want to tell yourself the truth, there are days you don't feel like going to work. When I didn't have anybody to confess to, I confessed to my children. I said, children. I said, if not for school fees, I won't go to work. So when I tell them that, when they get to their school, they know they have to read because the day that he says, I'm no longer going to work, <laughs> then you ask yourself, how do I go to school? The Bible says, as many as did receive him, he gave them power to become sons. Is it not sons that inherit fathers? Brethren, you rejoice because you have an inheritance waiting for you. Amen. Number two, you rejoice. Because the Bible says, come unto me, all ye that labor. You rejoice because you have help all the time. You have help how many times? Number three, you rejoice because you have what the world would love to have, which is the Spirit of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 14 and verse 16. It says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God. These are things we don't rejoice for. We only rejoice because we bought a new car. We only rejoice because we bought a new house. You know, coming to think about it, very few people will call pastor. Say, pastor, I received the Holy Ghost last week. Come and rejoice with me. At least in my many years of being a pastor, nobody has called me. But they will call me, pastor, I bought a new car. If not that they know that occasionally some things don't impress me, they will call me to come and help them celebrate their new shoe. <laughs> but by the grace of God, brethren, rejoice over spiritual things. Amen. Are we together? You are baptized with the Spirit of God is what rejoicing over. Your child is baptized is what rejoicing over. Number four. 
You rejoice because you have access to God. I don't think some, a lot of us understand the meaning of access to God. Access to God means that you have access to a king that everybody will wish to have, but few know how to get. Are we together? I know if some of you have access to the coin now, you will boast to all your friends. When they are there, you will purposely scroll through your phone and then you will put the number so that they will see queen. And then you say, oh, I'm just checking my phone, you know, that kind of thing. But you have access to the one that has the heart of the queen in his hands. Rejoice. Rejoice that when you pray, your prayers are answered. Rejoice because he even said, before you pray, he said, I will answer you. Rejoice because he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Rejoice because he said, I have a plan for you. I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Brethren, if, the, if a king of this world has a plan for you, won't you rejoice? How much more when the king of kings says he has a plan for you? You rejoice every day. Because the Bible says that though I pass through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You will rejoice because he says, when you pass through the waters, he says, yes, I'm there. You may not see me, but I'm telling you ahead of time, I'm there. He says, when you pass through the fire, or not to you, I'll be cooling the fire. And you'll just be saying that, ah, uh-uh, this fire is not as hot as I thought it would be. But somebody's there cooling the fire for you. Are we together? So every day when you wake up, look for a reason to rejoice. Every day when you are going to bed, look for a what? A reason to rejoice. I've given you five. Number six. No, number five, no. Five or six, I don't even know. Rejoice because every day, now this is, what, this is against everything else that we think, but every day brings you closer to your inheritance. Because every day brings you closer to death. And you cannot inherit without dying. It is the other way. In the things of the world, it is when somebody else dies that you inherit. In the things of God, it is when you die that you inherit. <laughs> so don't pray that you won't die. All of us will die. I know in our culture, you don't talk about death. You, you throw your hand like that. Don't feel bad. When I came to Canada, a lot of insurance brokers, for some reason, they, they, for some reason I attracted insurance brokers. Maybe, I don't know, maybe at that time, maybe they said they saw death on my face. I don't know. But they would just come. And I remember one used to come. He used to come all the way from St. John. And I used to look at this guy because that time I drove a Corolla, but this guy drove an S-class Mercedes-Benz. And I would ask myself, is this the same insurance that you are selling that you are buying this beautiful car? You must be killing people. I'm just coming from Africa. I, I, I'm new. And I would think to myself, you better don't do insurance with this one. If you do insurance with this one, you will die. Oh. Amen? Until I understood. The Bible says, when I was a child, brethren, I have learned that that child does not necessarily mean age. It just means that when I was unlearned, when I was inexperienced, and then I began to think the other way. Are we together? So when you wake up every day, say, glory be to God, I'm one day closer to my God. It's something to rejoice over. Yeah, you may not want to rejoice, but I'm telling you, it's something to rejoice over. Let me give you one more. Rejoice. 
And why do you rejoice? Because there are promises for every day. I was reading through the Beatitudes. It says, blessed are these, for this is the kingdom of God. Blessed are these, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are these. Are they not all blessings? Are they not all promises? They are. You rejoice because of those things. Why else do you rejoice? You rejoice because rejoicing brings victory. Oh, brethren, I've gone to watch one or two football matches. And I've noticed that when the fans see that their team is losing, what do they do? They start singing and playing music. Even the world knows the secret. As they are playing music, the people on the field, their head is swelling. I can't disappoint the fans. They will play what they have never played before. Uh, let me share a secret with you. When I was in school, I used to play soccer. And then after some time, I met a young lady that loved to watch soccer. So one time, we were playing. And for some reason, my team was losing. <sighs> Whenever everything I did didn't go well. You know, there are those days that even when the ball touches your leg, the ball just goes the wrong way. But then I avoided looking at the particular side of the field. And the reason was because there was somebody on that side that believed in me that I could do something. Are we together? But then all of a sudden, somebody shouted from the stands. There's a nickname they call me, but don't worry about that. <laughs> Somebody shouted from the stands. I said, you can do it. Oh, brethren, I became three men. I know what they call it in your language. Uh -huh. When I played in that game, you will have thought that I took something. Because somebody dared say they believed in me. Are we together? So... You rejoice because every day there is victory. And if there is victory, it means that God has set certain people to cheer you up. They may cheer you with words. They may cheer you with a text. They may cheer you, with, they may cheer you up with a message. Some, sometimes you just get a message from nowhere. Somebody will just encourage you. Right? You rejoice. You rejoice again because your rejoicing attracts both sinners and blessings. But then I don't know how many of you are so happy that um, the people that grumble and complain all the time are the ones that you love to be with. It doesn't always happen. In fact, you find ways to avoid them. Thank God for color ID. You may not tell me, but I know. When their phone rings, you just look at it. You say, God, forgive me. You turn your head to the other side. And the reason is because every time that person has called you, it has been a problem. Even when there was no problem, that person will create a problem. Amen? But then, when you know that that person calling, that every time you talk to them, your spirit is lifted. Before the phone rings twice, what do you do? Uh, so that they don't change their mind. That is the truth. There are some phone calls when I see, I pick immediately. Because that phone call can change the direction of my day. Brethren, we are in February now. We have been talking about attitude. We have been talking about changing. We have been talking about this. All of these things I'm telling you about rejoicing in every circumstance, it will show in your behavior. When it shows in your behavior, it will then determine will people love to be close to you or people love to be away from you? I'll read you a story and then I'll close. A 12-year-old boy 
knelt down at the usual time to thank God for his mercies of the day. And then, of course, to pray for the night. And then, as usual, he came to the part where he says, God bless mother, and he couldn't pronounce the other word. The prayer stopped, and the boy looked sad. As he looked up, he saw his mother. The mother was helpless as she noticed that her son had now matured to a stage that he was noticing that there was a void. The boy says, I can no longer pray for my father. And then the mother says, why? Says, since I've been able to speak and I've been able to pray, I have prayed daily for daddy. When he said that, the mother says, what do you want to do? He says, every day when I say God bless mother, I also say God bless father. He said, but father has been dead now for six years. Then he said, no problem. I will not leave him out anyway. And so this is, this is the way I will pray. I will say, thank God I once had a father that loved me. Let's stand on our feet. Thank God I once had what? A father that loved me. It means your rejoicing does not have to be circumstantial. Even in things that you think is a loss, there's a blessing there somewhere. But then just for the next five minutes, I want you to lift up your voice to heaven. Maybe your rejoicing has been circumstantial. You only rejoice when good things happen. You only rejoice when the blessing comes. You only rejoice when you get a good news. You only rejoice. But you have never thought it could be worse than this. You have never thought to yourself, oh, your children had an accident. Naturally, you will feel bad. But all of them came out. You never thought to yourself that what if they all died? Are we together? Your child broke your plate, but you have never thought what if that plate broke the child? But you have never thought of that. All you think about is the five dollars, ten, fifteen dollars you are going to use to replace the plate. You have never thought, brethren, that day by day your child may not be the best in his class. But the best child in that class, their mothers are praying that their child will be like yours. But you have never, you don't even know that. All you are thinking about is that my child is not the first in the class. But then you want to go to God in prayer and tell him that, Lord, in this month of February, I pray that my attitude will change. I pray that my attitude will change. It is your attitude that determines if you are joyful or not. It is your attitude that determines what is in your heart. It is your attitude that determines what you do. You need an attitude of rejoicing in little things, in big things. When your hopes are dashed, do you thank God? Do you thank God knowing that this is the plan of God concerning you? When disappointment comes, that business that you thought you would get, you didn't get it, that contract, you didn't get it. Do you thank God? Do you thank God when you do a business and it doesn't turn out right? Do you ever think to yourself, it could be worse? But then let's lift up our voice. We have about two or three minutes left. Just appreciate God and say, Father, I ask you, oh God, that day by day, that I will have a grateful heart. That day by day, that in all things, I will be able to rejoice. Day by day, I will pray without ceasing. I'll talk about that in the second service. That day by day, Lord, that my joyfulness will attract men to you. That day by day, 
that I will be reminded of the things that God has done. That day by day, I'll be reminded of the hope of my calling. 